is the messages out there today that people <clears throat> are sending out to each other is have it your way. Do what you want to do. But I got something to say. There are some sounds that's coming into your ears and they're coming to your ears from people that are in hell. When you have a restless night and you say you've had an awful dream or a nightmare or whatever, in a daytime when you find yourself troubled, could it be because of sounds from some of your loved ones in hell that are trying to penetrate the veil and get through to you? Maybe it's someone that you knew and they found themselves in hell. Is it the groans of those souls that are damned for eternity that's trying to call out to us? Some say that hell is not real. It's something made up by religious people to get men to do good and be better. But the problem with that is Jesus gave us a story about a rich man and a beggar in hell. And who is Jesus? Well, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. Now that means Jesus is part of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We have a lot of examples in the Bible about the Trinity. I'm going to cite just two of them and then get on with the message. One of them in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them, meaning male and female, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so, who then is the us and the our if there is not more than one? Now our God is one, yes. But our God is a Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so, the next one, just before Jesus began his ministry, we read in the Bible that he was baptized. Matthew chapter 3. Now, baptism is going to be explained why we do baptism right here in these verses out of the mouth of Jesus himself. He's, John the Baptist speaking in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 3, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire and Jesus when he was baptized went straight away up out of the water and lo the heavens were open unto him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him and a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so we can plainly see there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, just in a few little verses right there. And what the Bible says, Jesus is part of the Godhead bodily, and we're complete in Him. If these verses show us that, then we ought to realize that it is God speaking to us through this holy word what he has to say to us. If God wants to tell us something in a parable, he speaks in parables. If he, if he doesn't wish to speak to us in a parable and he wishes to tell us a truth, then he just plainly says what he means to say. In John chapter 1, 
The Bible says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, so you're not thinking, well, wait a minute, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. How could he be God? Did he become God after he was whatever? But see, that verse there says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, who or what is the Word? Well, in verse 14 it says, The Word was made flesh. You see there? And dwell among us. And we beheld the glory, the glory as of. As of. Now catch that. As of. The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, Jesus was <laughs> provided a body. We read about how He was provided a body in Hebrews. Uh, and, and he says, A body that thou hast prepared for me in offerings and sacrifices thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. And so when the angel came down and told Mary that she was highly favored among men, she said, Be it unto me as thou hast said. And at that moment, she became pregnant, probably at that moment, she became pregnant, overshadowed, so to speak, according to the word of God by the Holy Spirit and the baby for the spiritual Jesus was there implanted within her at that point in time. It says in verse 3 of this same chapter we're in, all things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. So Jesus made everything and that's what we have to realize now. And so when we look at that Jesus as the Maker, God the Father, as the Son, this is what I want you to do. Okay, now, <clears throat> there are people that say that this is, uh, this is going to be really confusing because there are people that say that there is only one God and um, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all wrapped up in this one. There are other people who say that there are three. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are three different entities. And whether either one of them is correct or not, I can't tell you because it's beyond our human comprehension. We're never going to be able to understand it. Can you understand that I'm a father? I'm also Marie's husband. Okay? Uh, I'm a man, you know, and, and that makes me three different types of individuals too, doesn't it? But that doesn't even compare with the Godhead though, does it? Just because I have different names, that I put on a different hat for a different, like being a father, I'm, I'm my parents, when they was living, well, even after their death, I'm still their son. There's nothing I can do to change that. And so, Jesus, as God has always existed. And it was Him, I want to make it clear, it was Him who created hell. Hell was not even created for people. You see, I don't know why people want to go there because it wasn't something that God said, well, let me do this for my people. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41 says, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. See? Jesus created this for the devil and his angels. So now if we get into the message this morning, it comes out of Luke chapter 16. And I begin in verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. Now, he doesn't say anything about this being a parable. He's talking about a real-life person here. He said there was a certain rich man, a real-life person. Now, he doesn't give his name, because then people are going to go back and they're going to mark it down and they're going to make some holiday about it and all kinds of craziness. So he just tells us a generalization. But it's a real story about a real individual. And there was a certain beggar, and he gives his name, and his name is Lazarus. So everybody that lived around there would probably know who this rich man was. 
as well as they would know who Lazarus was. Because he sat at this man's gate, at verse 20, he was laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And so this man was in pretty bad shape, and the only doctor he had was this dog. And all this dog could do for him was lick his sores. And so the scripture was not spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ to show you the state of just two single persons only. But it is for everyone. If you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, he speaks many times about hell in his ministry. He said in one place it was good if it would be better to lose your arm and enter into heaven than to be cast into hell with two arms or two legs or your eye or whatever. He spoke many, many times in the Gospels about hell, more so than we see anybody else hardly want to preach about it today. In 2 Peter chapter 2, um, he's expounding on what Jesus had told his disciples. And he says in verse 4, If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Now that word for hell right there, if you'll look it up, it's in the Greek, Tartarus. Tartarus. And delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now this is referring to that lower parts of hell. The worst part of hell that you could go to. And this is reserved for the angels that came down from heaven and had sex with human women and got them pregnant and they had, well, we read about it in Genesis chapter 6. And God put these angels here where they can't do anything else to mankind until he's ready to pass a judgment upon them. And that will happen at the end of this world. There's still some time left for that to happen yet. So they're still down there. And they've been there ever since God placed them there back in Genesis chapter 6. Now, Christ in his message wants to show us the state of the godly person as well as the ungodly person. And what is going to be their state at the end of their life here on this earth? Now, in this story, it should be plain to us. There was a rich man in hell. He lifted up his eyes in torments, the Bible says. And so we look at that verse and we say, well, he lifted up his eyes. He opened his eyes so he could see in hell. So people say spirits don't have eyes. Well, he's more than a spirit, and isn't he? He could feel because he said he's tormented in this flame. He could actually know what water would taste like because he would. He pled for uh, him to send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and touch his tongue with it. Just a drop of water. That's all he wanted, just one drop of water. And yet he couldn't get in. And so... All these functions that we have in life that we think about, all of our see, hear, taste, touch, smell, all that good stuff that we have, that he's going to have this, and people are going to have it. And so when you look at yourself, how could you hate someone so bad that you would want them to go to hell? How could we not tell our children, our grandchildren, about an eternal destiny that is going to be so awful that God had to chain these angels in darkness because they was going to try to do whatever to get out of there, I guess. I don't know. But it's going to be such an awful place. How could we not tell people about this place of eternal torment? Now, there's a lot of people say, well, that's fine, but when, when I die, there'll be so many people there, they won't have room for me, so they'll have to throw me somewhere else. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 14 tells us something else, though. 
Jesus spoke this stuff to us who are living at the end of the generations. That we should take notice that we don't fall into the same kind of condition or let some of the people that we have to deal with fall into this condition. In Isaiah chapter 5 verse 14, Therefore hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. So no matter how many people go there, there's always going to be room for more. Because hell is continually enlarging itself to make room for more and more and more. And so don't think that hell will be full <laughs> and they'll have a sign up, no vacancy. There'll be plenty of room for you if that's where your eternal destiny is going to be. Now, these words that I'm going to be talking about up here this morning, I'm going to try to pass through, and I'm going to try to be as briefly as I can with some of these truths that God wants us to see, because there is enough room now for all of us in hell. There is plenty of room. So we need to listen to the words that God is trying to tell us today. So let these words... Let them be profitable to you. That when you're out in a conversation with someone and you're angry with them and you're thinking angry thoughts towards this person, are you thinking so angrily that you would want them to be in a place like this? Think about how you're dealing with that situation. Not so much as you yourself, but somebody that you may know. In Luke chapter 16, verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar. See, both of these times he says certain. That means it's real. A certain rich man, a certain beggar. You see there? He's talking about two individual people. But he's giving us this so we'll know that is, we could be one of them people. One or the other. And it depends on what we do in this life as to our circumstances, and doesn't it? It says this certain beggar named Lazarus was laid at his gate full of sores. Now first off, these words that were spoken by Jesus himself is to all the world. But then there are people that want to cast some kind of a interpretation to them and there are people that say oh well this is just a parable and oh it was this and so on and so forth if Jesus had said only there was a certain rich man which fared sumptuously every day and a certain beggar laid in his gate full of sores the world would have made this conclusion he didn't say only you see, he said there was a certain rich man, but not a certain rich man only, you see. So that means there can be room for someone else. Again, if you would be the judge of men according to outward appearance, you might take this whole story as merely a parable and let it go. But it's not a parable. It's a real story. And so the rich man was... Well, you could say he was a happy man because at first look it represents such a thing as a person who is really happy with what he has. But if we take it together and we read the whole story, well, what happens to him? He ain't so happy at the end, is he? Matter of fact, he's in bad shape, worse than, it, than if he had a lived the worst life he could have lived here on this earth. And so, if we would be a judge according to the outward appearance, think about that. How do you judge things? Here's a man, to all outward appearances, appears that he's a blessed man. Better by many in so much as he's rich. He has everything in his life that he wants. He has 
lots of clothes, lots of good food to eat. He's happy. He's content. He's probably overweight because you see these people that have everything in the world. You've seen them on TV a lot. And what do they look like? Are they taking care of their bodies? You see? The beggar is poor. He's naked. And he's glad he has his dog for a doctor. Because his dog comes and licks his sores. I guess he gets some kind of relief from that. This beggar desires to be fed with the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. But the rich man, he's hanging right in there. He fares better every day. But here the beggar, he's glad for whatever little bit that he can get. Who wouldn't, if we look at the way the world looks at things, who wouldn't want to be like the rich man is? Because this rich man's condition, he looks to be, hey man, yeah, he's hanging in there. A wealthy man has lots of suits and what are they kind of things that they want to eat, you know? And anybody that's minding earthly things would say, Whoa, I wish I was in his condition. I wish I had what he has. If I did, then oh man, I would do this and I would do that. But this life that I live, I could have my heart's desire. I could have all the good stuff that I'd ever want. I would live pleasantly and I would say to my soul, be of good cheer, eat, drink, and be merry. For I have everything plenty and I'm in a most blessed condition. Now, when we look at a parable, let me give you a parable in Luke chapter 12. And I'll show you how a parable would be begin when Jesus is talking about somebody or something. Now he could be speaking about this rich man here uh, in Luke chapter 16, back here in Luke 12 and verse 16. And he spoke a parable unto them. See there? He spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, what shall I do because I have no room to bestow all my fruits? And I said, this I'll do. I'll pull down my barns, I'll build greater. And there I'll bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. That kind of sounds like what Jesus said. It's, as in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving it done it kind of draws that to my attention. Eating and drinking. Having a good time. Not thinking about what's going to happen. Like a grasshopper. He runs around watching the ants all the time. He sees them ants over there carrying stuff all in the ground and doing this, that, and the other all summer long. Grasshopper just eats what he sees and whatever he wants and he don't do anything. But when the freezing ice and snow gets here, the ants are way down underneath the ground. What happened to the grasshopper who'd done nothing? Just walked around and ate up what was there. What happened to him? See? And he says in verse 20, But God said to him, Thou fool! <laughs> God calls this rich man a fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall all these things be? which thou hast provided. I listened to a song by um, uh, George Jones the other day in some of our gospel music, an old song, and he talks about when his mother passed away, how the children come in, some took the silverware she had, closets and clothes and this, that, and the other, but one thing they didn't take was this old Bible. Nobody wanted it. He took it. Later on in the song, he talks about how he'd seen the old radio that his mama had that was broke down and messed all up in some kind of thrift store. Seen some of his mama's old clothes. He said, but I still have mama's old Bible. It's the Word of God that's going to last. 
No matter what we say, no matter what we do, it's going to be the Word of God that holds true. And so God said to him, This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Who's going to, who's going to get all your stuff then? Because you can't take it with you. Who's it going to be? And he says in verse 21, So he that lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. You see there, it's not the fact that treasure and riches are, are bad. It's what people do with them. You know, they're greedy. <laughs> Real greedy. And I say this, the conclusion that judge, when people judge according to the outward appearance, maybe Jesus is alluding to the rich man in Luke chapter 16. You know? In Luke chapter 16, verse 15, he says, You are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And so you see, all this money and all this stuff that people have, like we see all these, I noticed uh, on MSN the other day they had a thing about these televangelists and it showed pictures of a couple of women that were televangelists and how rich they were and how much money they made and so on and so forth. Though they may be rich to this world but are they rich to God? You see, even they're talking about God's word and what they're doing. They're making a living. They're making all this money off of God's word. But what are they doing with it? Are they laying up their self-treasure in heaven or what are they doing? When we take eternity into account, a whole new thought arises. In John chapter 16, in verse 22, Jesus is speaking again. He says, And you now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man takes away from you. In verse 23, And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. The thing is, when we come to Jesus, he changes things around. If you've got some money, it's going to change your heart. What you're going to do with it. You know, I'm not saying that people that have money, all of them is going to hell. But the story is about, not, it, on, on our appearances, it looks like a, a rich man and, and, and a poor man. But if we look at the whole story, we see it's not just a rich man and a poor man. It's a godly man and an ungodly man. It's what you do with what you have. You can do, you can be an ungodly person and be poor. There's a lot of people that I, I've seen right here that came into this church that are ungodly and they're as poor as dirt. And so you don't have to be rich to be ungodly. And you don't have to be poor to be godly. You see? So Jesus is trying to make a point that we should look at. Don't look at the outward appearance like that's the only thing that counts because God judges the heart. You see, that's what he's looking at. He's not looking at all this other mess. The beggar, well, the condition of the rich man, when you look at it, is the saddest condition. If you look at it, on the outward part of him because the outward part is deceiving because where does he end up at? In hell he lifted up his eyes. But the beggar, according to the word of God, actually had the best part. Though when we look at it from the outward appearance of the world, it seems like his state is the saddest of part of all. 
But see, don't miss the whole point that God's trying to show us. It's the heart that He's looking at. What is the heart about, you see? Don't judge according to the appearance of things, but judge righteous judgment. And so, in James chapter 4, verse 1, he says, From whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that you war in your members? You lust and have not? You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain? You fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. Verse 3, You ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. You adulterers and adulteresses. See now, he's getting down to the point. See, you're living for the world. You're not living for God. You adulterers and you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship of the world is an enemy, is an enemy of God? <laughs> Whoever, therefore, would be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. That's what the Word of God is saying here, see? And, and, and people in the churches have taken it all wrong. They go, oh, come on in here, Mr. Mr. Rich Man. You can have the front row seat. You can sit right up here. And, and you, can, you can be the best. Hey, Larry, let me get up. Somebody go get a stool to put under this man's feet. But here come a poor man in the church. They ain't got a bit of use for him. And why is that? Because they're judging according to the appearance of things? I read on the internet sometimes this poor beggar or homeless man came up and done this, that, and the other and then goes into this place and they end up finding out he was the CEO or the owner of the company. And they treated him like dirt. They're his own employees. But then he, they find out he's the owner of the company, and I guess he fires them because of what they've done. So John chapter 7, verse 24 says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And that's where we need to look at ourselves. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. And that's what we have to look at. So look at the rich man's heart. He wouldn't even give the beggar anything. And he, yet he had an abundance. Like the other rich man. I'm going to build me bigger barns. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get I'm going to do nothing for nobody. I'm just going to do this for me. It's all about me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, do you look on things after the outward appearance? <coughs> if any man trusts in himself that he is Christ, let of, him, of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. So there are people that are belonging to Christ that church people they don't know a thing about because they're judging the wrong kind of judgment in Revelation Jesus is looking back because he's being revealed that's what Revelation means he's being revealed as to who he is in chapter 3 verse 17 he says because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked? You see? Are you really judging? Are you clothed with righteousness? You know? Whereas in here, in this story about the rich man, the man of wealth, but isn't this probably a man of the devil? I mean, he ends up where the devil's going to be. So he has to be a man of the devil even though he has lots. He has an abundance of enjoyments. And yet he's not carried by the angels to heaven. But he opens up his eyes in eternal burning. Luke chapter 12, verse 20. But God said to him, Thou fool, 
This night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Verse 21, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich towards God. See, we just need to examine ourselves on a daily basis as to where we're standing. There's a lot of people that go to church and they sit around and they got their mouth so tightened up uh, because they're afraid to open their mouth and tell people anything because they're afraid they might make a mistake. I suppose. But it's a trap that the devil has caught many millions of poor souls by getting them to judge the outward appearance not according to God's blessing. And if you ask some of these poor, carnal, covetous men, how should we know the state of a man? And he will answer you, for the most part, that God blesses the man whom he loves and takes care of and gives an abundance of this world too. But is that right? Does God really bless a person by giving them all these things that's going to make them do things? Because for the most part, we see people that has a lot of money. To me, I see them that, that look to me like they're cursed. And the rich man if you use him as an example, he lift up his eyes in hell. You know? So the message is not for everyone. We, we need to understand these messages that I preach aren't for everyone. Because not a lot of people are going to want to hear what I have to say. You know? My message is for the whosoever that knows this world is not their home. We are strangers, pilgrims. We're passing through. This world is not our home. And people want to take possession of this whole world and everything that's in it. And like, that's the only thing that counts to them. Oh, I have this and I have that and I can do this and I can do that. Money and fame here on this earth is not the main thing. What should be on your mind? It shouldn't be money and fame. I mean, isn't heaven your home? Why aren't you thinking about heavenly things? In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Ecclesiastes means the preacher. And verse 13, it says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. <laughs> and it if God, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now there's a lot of these preachers out there today. T.D. Jakes, for one, he just preached a message about the Sabbath. I didn't watch the message because I know what his preaching is all about. Prosperity and such. But... I'm sure he's probably telling you you don't have to keep God's Sabbath. But why are all these verses in the Bible that tells us that well, that's what we should be doing, keeping God's commandments? Why do we run across these verses over and over and over? And then we have men standing up. Oh, you don't have to do that. We're this and we're that and we're this. and You know what? I don't believe the word they're saying I'd rather believe the Word of God. I'd rather believe what God has to say over what any man has to say at any time. Because there are so many poor blinded souls. Think about it. It is the rich man who lifted up his eyes in hell. T.D. Jakes is an awful rich man now. Think about that. It's the rich man that doesn't want to do what God says. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. 
And the poor man who thinks, well, I want to be like that rich man. <laughs> hmm. What's his problem? Is he a godly man? Because he wants to be like the rich man and have what the rich man has? The rich man died. And in hell, now mark my words, in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Now you think about that. Do you really want to be a rich man and lift up your eyes in hell? You think? Jesus said it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. Now, he didn't say it was impossible. But if a camel goes through the eye of a needle before a rich man gets into heaven, let me tell you something. <clears throat> we see these great ones in this world go strutting in up and down the streets and sometimes it makes me wonder. i give you an example. I see so much in the news, Elon Musk. Everywhere I look, Elon Musk. I don't know why, why he's become such a person in the news. Turn on the YouTube and start scrolling through there. About every other thing got his picture on and he said this or he did that. But look to me when I look at this man, he's got a he's got a a mind about him, no doubt about it. But look how much good he could do for people. But what does he do with the knowledge that God has given him to build a, a an electric car? And do it cheaper than anyone else because his profit margin is 30, 35, 40 percent. When most of the dealers make 10 percent, 7 percent, and some of the Chinese dealers don't make but 4 or 5 percent. He's making 30 percent at least minimum off of his cars. And so why are his prices so high then? Well, all the rest of the people. Volkswagen and all of them, they're copying his prices to mark their car. So we would have some cheap electric cars if this man hadn't done what he'd done, one, one could say. But is he looking at himself as a happy man? Is he helping people? Is that money making him feel like he's content? Maybe he looks upon himself as the only happy man in the world. But is it because he judges according to the outward appearance? How does he fare with God? You see? Is he like the camel going through the eye of the needle? Think about that. He might be the richest man in America. But if he doesn't make heaven his own, he's going to lift up his eyes in hell. Now, what, what would you rather do? <laughs> would you like to have all the money in the world and then die and go to hell for eternity? Maybe he looks upon himself to be the only blessed man. But the Lord knows he's left out the really blessed condition. He could have helped so many people. He could have dropped the price of them vehicles and the way he throws money away like he wasted all that money buying Twitter and now he's made a bombshell out of it and it's a wreck and look what good he could have done with all that money how many people he could have helped with that money money is not everything and power and all this stuff that's not everything it's loving God and loving each other and doing what God says to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he needs to read these verses. Begin in verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Verse 28, And base things of this world, and things which are despised, 
This is what God has chosen, yea, and the things which are to bring to naught the things which are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, verse 30, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. That as, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Not mankind. And what are they doing? Every other uh, thing on the internet today now is <coughs> people's getting away from religion. They're no longer into religion and they no longer want anything to do with God. <coughs> this one woman is trying to get her daughter uh, from being religiously indoctrinated and all this kind of stuff. You know, but when we look at this, these people that are saying and doing all this, and they're bragging about how they can do this, that, and the other, that nobody dare look upon them. But if they could see their future, if they could see their end, would they hang down their heads and cry if they could see themselves as a rich man in hell today? And would they say the same thing that the rich man said? Send Lazarus to dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue. These. Let me add here that these people that have so much in the world who are greedy and selfish, they have not a care. But you know, they don't have just their portion in this life. Somehow they have taken from their brothers and sisters who are on this earth, they've taken their portion and added to themselves. And they've left the world a far worse place than if they had done the right thing with their riches. People need to take heed to the hereafter You know, you find yourself in hell and you lift up your eyes in torment and you look afar off, oh, the Lazarus, he's up there in heaven. How about sending him down here to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue? In hell, he's still trying to give orders. Yeah, Elon Musk said, do this, do that, or you're fired. Sounds pretty much like Donald Trump. Do this, do that, you're fired. And in hell, they still trying to give orders. Send Lazarus that he may give his... What's Lazarus have to do with it? Who gave you the authority to order God around? What makes you think you are so high and mighty? After all, you are the one in hell. You are the one they're burning... And yet you still want to give orders. And Psalm 17, verse 12, the Bible says, Like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. That's what they're like. They're like these lions that they're going to get a hold of one of these poor animals that didn't get away from them. And they ain't going to share it with another lion. They're going to eat it all up themselves. So these people that seek after and they desire these riches, let me ask you this question. Would you be content that God would take this away from you? If, would you still be content if you didn't have what you have? In Galatians chapter 4, verse 29, But as then he was he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit. So it is now. And so, what are you looking for in this life? Would you be glad to be kept out of heaven with all your clothing and dainty foods to eat and your belly filled with the goodness of this world and yet you're still craving a drop of water? Think about that. 
In James chapter 5, verse 6, he says, You have contempt, condemned and killed the just, and he does not resist you. What did Lazarus do? He didn't resist, did he? Why are we always resisting? Would you be glad to have all the things in this life and, and not heaven to be your home? Would you be happy if you had everything in this world? A mansion, a big fine automobile, lots of food, anything that your heart's content. But knowing when you die you're going to hell, would you still be happy? You see, it's about believing then, isn't it? Because the rich man probably, well, yeah, I deserve to go to heaven. I mean, look how much money I got. But when he died, he can't take none of it with him. He has to leave it all here. If you say, no, you don't want to go to hell, and you want to make heaven your home, what are you doing about it? Are you still trusting in the riches of this world? Do you wish to be like the rich man that Jesus spoke of? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, the Bible says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Will you let the wealth of this world bar you from going to heaven? Will you let the wealth of this world deceive you? No wonder they want to prove there ain't no God. It's not that way they can live in this world like they're living. And all their sciences that they're, that they're, they're doing out there today, that's all they want to do is prove there is no God. And that way they feel like they're not going to come into condemnation. But, you see, he, he cannot. That's the thing about God. He cannot say that He doesn't exist. Because He's God. And if He didn't exist, there would nothing exist. Because without Him was not anything made that was made. <coughs> so why are the ungodly held under this Thing like the rich man did. First Timothy chapter six, verse seventeen says, "Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy." Rich men are liable to the devil's temptations. More so than the poor man, I suppose. And they are the most ready to be puffed up with pride, with the cares of this world, in which things they spend most of their time and their lust on. Drunkenness, wantonness, idleness, along with other works of the flesh. In the book of James, chapter 5, now, the Bible has plenty to say about this stuff. In James chapter 5, one, verse 1, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped up treasure together for the last days. People better watch what they're doing because this is something that the snare of the devil. The devil is using this kind of stuff to get you away from God so he can get you to hell. Because he would comfort the hearts of his own. <laughs> but God has chosen the poor, the despised, you remember we read the base things of this life? In Colossians chapter 3 he says, these people that trust in riches, he says, for which things sake the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Do you think that God, that God has set the rich man in his state 
Do you think that God has put him there with his children so they will have no share in the life to come? The Lord himself that declares that the rich ones of the world are for the most part in the saddest condition. Because of unbelief, they harden themselves. They seek for the glory of this world as though Jesus didn't mean what he said. But the Lord does not, not mean that those who are ungodly, he does not mean that those who are ungodly are rich in the world. Because there are yet many ungodly men in this world and women who are still poor. So it isn't being ungodly because you're rich and it isn't being ungodly because you're poor. It's your physical, no, your spiritual condition. Many right now are crying out for the appearance of the Almighty God and His Son, Jesus Christ, the judgment. But let me tell you, Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, thou shalt not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. Think about that. You've got people right now calling out to God to avenge their blood on the earth. The kings of the earth, verse 15 says, and great men and rich men and chief captains and mighty men and every bondman and free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? So we know when we look at our life, what are we doing with God? Does Christ say there was a certain rich man? Yet you must understand his meaning. When he talks about the rich man, what is his meaning? He's talking about people who live worldly, doing worldly things and have not a care in this world for anybody but themselves. They are worldly people, whether they are rich or whether they are poor. If you choose not to understand this message thus far this morning, then there will be one day that you will understand it. It's in Revelation chapter 20, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, verse 11, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And so what's going to happen one day? Yeah, you'll be been dead for a long time, and you'll be been in hell for a long time. And you remember that old body that you left behind, and you left in the grave? Well, just like the children that are called out of God are going to get a new body, you're not. You're going to get your same old body. The very body that you had when you died. And if it was eat up with cancer, if it only had one arm or one leg, whatever condition that body was in, you're going to stand before God here. I saw this great white throne. Read that verse with me again. There was no place left for anybody but the dead. Verse 12. Small and great, they stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things written in the books, according to their works. They were all brought here to be told their eternal destiny in that wicked body that they are in will be going to the lake of fire. Whosoever, verse 15, that was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, with everyone that appears at this white throne judgment are going to the lake of fire. You're going to be there and you're going to hear the screams and the hollers, the sounds of hell, but you're not going to be able to touch and reach out and, and, and lay your hand on somebody. You're not going to be able to feel God's love. You're not going to be able to feel somebody that cares for you. 
you're going to feel your own feelings. You're going to feel pain, heartache. And you're going to remember every message that you ever heard. Everything that Jesus ever had to say to you, you're going to remember. Luke chapter 16, <coughs> verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember, see there, <coughs> that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. You're going to remember everything and every message that you ever heard. And you're going to remember what you felt like at that time. And you're going to curse your own self. And you're going to look around and you're going to see your children and your grandchildren, your great, 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 great grandchildren there in the lake of fire with you. But you can't reach out and touch them. All you can do is hear their screams. And they're going to accuse you because you didn't do nothing to tell them that there was such a place of torment. Hell's going to be bad enough. But look what it's going to be when you have your children and your grandchildren condemning you for the way you've lived your life. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 15 says, While it is said today, if you will hear His voice, think about that now, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts, as in a provocation. For some, when they heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was He grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but them that believed not. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. You don't believe God's going to do it? You will find out. It's time for you to make a decision. Again in Hebrews chapter 4 he says in verse 7, He limited a certain day saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Therefore, verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. We are the people of God. But if riches is the only thing on your mind, are you really a child of God? Think about that. Let us labor, he says in verse 11, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. What are you trusting in? Are you trusting in the world? Or will you trust Him today to be your Lord and Savior? That's the thing. Are you trusting God to be your Lord and Savior today? In hell... You will hear these sounds more so than ever before anywhere else because you will be there with those in hell if you do not make Jesus your Savior. It's not by works of righteousness that we've done, but by His own good mercy. He washed us. He saved us. He regenerated us. He made us brand new creatures. And a brand new creature made in Christ Jesus is not craving the world. He's looking for eternal life. He's looking for his heavenly home. He's not looking for that city that's going up, but the one that's coming down from God. We need to press on so we can enter into that great city. We can be saved by grace without the works of righteousness, without our money, without whatever else that we come with, when we call upon Jesus, we say, Lord, I believe. I believe and I confess You as my Savior. And Lord, I want to go to that heaven. And if I have to give up everything I have here on this earth to do that, I'm willing to do that this morning. Are You willing? Let us come to the altar now.
where he gives us a song of invitation. Thank you.